Hello, I'm Oliver Cook. I'm a curator of horology here at the British Museum and welcome to my corner. Today I'm going to go through how a clock works and to do this I'm going to introduce you to this clock which is a clock that's nearly entirely made of wood. It was made in 1688 in Davos in Switzerland. Now to do this we usually like to break it down into five elements. Energy, wheels, escapement, controller and indicator. Five elements. So let us start with energy, our power source. A clock is a machine. All machines need a source of power. There is no such thing as perpetual energy. And in this case, this clock is driven by a weight. And when we hang the weight on the hook, the clock starts ticking. Now, weights are very, a very, very good source of energy. They are drawn down by the constant force of gravity. They provide a clock with a very constant supply of power, which is what a clock needs to be as accurate as possible. When we wind the clock, this is very simple. I tug on the counterweight. This is just there to keep things in place. This is what is powering the clock. And I've just put energy from my muscles, from my breakfast this morning, into that weight against gravity. And now it's trying to pull, pull down and that's how it's driving the clock. So that is our first element, energy. So our second element, wheels. Now wheels are what we horologists like to call gears. Most people call them gears or cogs. But what we're really referring to are wheels with teeth on. And the teeth are there so that one wheel can drive another with no slippage. They can drive the next wheel very precisely. And what we have here, we actually have two mechanisms in this clock. This side of this central bar, we have the go, what's called the going train. And that, that is responsible for the timekeeping of the clock. Every clock and mechanical watch has a going train. And on the right hand side here, we have the striking train. And that's a mechanism for sounding the bell. But let's talk about the going train first, the timekeeping side of things. So we have, we've talked about our source of energy. That weight is pulling down on this cord and it's trying to drive this pulley round. And that wheel there is in fact moving very, very slowly and we can't see it. But the wheel it's meshing with, our second wheel in the train, you can see moving. And it's meshing just here at the top of the wheel with this very small wheel that we call a pinion, all made in wood. In this wheel of many teeth, he's driving this small wheel, this pinion, with not many teeth. So this pinion's got about seven leaves on it, I think, seven teeth on it. This big wheel only has to move seven teeth to send this wheel around a complete revolution. And that's what's happening here. We're accelerating the speed of this wheel. We can see it's moving quicker here, and the last wheel in our train, the escape wheel, which we'll come to next, is moving around visibly quicker again. And the reason we want to do that is because we want the weight to descend slowly. We want the clock to last for a sensible amount of time between windings. Up at the business end of the clock, if you like, on our third element, the escapement and controller, our fourth element, things happen more quickly. This is just a virtue of the laws of physics and mother nature. So we have to increase this speed, and this is why we have our wheels, our second element. And now we move on to element three, the escapement. Now the escapement is the tick-tock that you hear in a clock or mechanical watch. It's the beating heart of a clock, if you like. And what's happening here, vertically in here, we have a metal shaft. There is some metal in this clock. And on that shaft are two flag-like pieces, which we call pallets, and they're doing this. And so the teeth of the escape wheel, or the pins in this case, are alternately pushing these pallets one way than the other, one way than the other. And that's the tick-tock you hear of those pins sliding off one face onto the, another. In horology, the louder that tick-tock, the worse, because that's the louder it is, the more energy is being wasted. And a good clock should have a quiet tick-tock, generally speaking. What's happening is this rotational motion of this last wheel in our train is being converted to an oscillatory motion, left, right, back and forth. 
and that is driving our fourth element, our controller. This is, is the brain of the clock of the escape. It's the beating heart of the clock. The controller is the brain of the clock. It's governing the rate at which everything happens. It's governing the rate of the tick and the tock. So it's oscillating backwards and forwards. What determines the rate that this happens? Several things. One is the power that the clock's getting. If I give it a bit more power by just tugging on the weight a little bit, you'll hear the clock speed up. What else, what else determines the rate? It's the weight of the balance wheel up here, in this case, and the size of it. Because what's happening is the power is feeding momentum into this object. So the heavier it is and the bigger it is, the more momentum it requires to keep going. So, and then in this case, the balance wheel has a band of lead around its rim just to give it that more, bit more weight. This form of controller was with us since the, well, the dawn of horology in perhaps the 12th or 13th century. We're not sure exactly when or who invented the mechanical clock, but around then, and this, this form of escapement and controller were in place from the beginning. And it stayed in horology up until 1656 when the Dutch mathematician, mathematician and physicist Christian Huygens worked out how to apply the pendulum to the clock. And that, that, from that point forward, that was the main form of controller. And finally, our fifth element is in the indicator. We're most familiar with the dial on a watch or clock, and we read the time quite happily. We're taught to do it as young children. Um, in this case, we have an hour hand here for 12 hours. And down here, what should be a minute hand. It's only marked for the quarters, but it goes around once an hour. And missing in this little slot here should be a little pointer. And normally we're more used to seeing the minute hand and hour hand concentric. So this is a little bit different. And this is typical of these Dapos clocks, in fact. The other form of indicator that this clock has got is a bell. Well, it hasn't got it because it's missing. As I mentioned earlier, it should be up here and a hammer would hit it. Three, three strikes for three o'clock. So, so that's how a clock works in five elements. Energy, wheels, escapement, controller, and indicator, or every witch eats crunchy insects, is what we like to tell the children to help them remember this. Next week, I'll be pulling apart this lovely clock from Davos and putting it back together and seeing if it still ticks at the end. If you don't want to miss that, then please do subscribe to the British Museum YouTube channel. Thank you.